my agent, he watched me really just um, be a shell of myself. He said, Jeremy, this might be your last game in the NBA. Dude, your back is against the wall. And if you're going to get knocked out, do it a swing. Driving to the basket, does it again. Lynn looking to penetrate, pull up jump shot. It's good. Jeremy Lynn gets to the rim. We, uh, basically what happened was we played in Boston, we got back around, you know, whatever, like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., that I was on Landry Field's couch um, because my brother and sister-in-law had friends in town, so they were crashing on the couch where I normally crash. And so by the time we get to Landry's apartment, he's like, this is my couch, I told you it was small. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is smaller than I thought. And I had my head hanging off one end, legs hanging off the other, I was curled up you know, in a fetal position, I still couldn't even fit on a couch. So I wake up the next morning, uh, terrible night's rest. So immediately go to Sky Town, grab a fresh set of clothes. And uh, I stopped by with Paya Dog and then I went to MSG. And that was just my day. And it was just like this feeling of like, is this the end? And, you know, I remember my agent calling me and he was basically saying like, look, this is probably your last game in the NBA. If you don't, if, if they even give you an opportunity to get on the floor, he said, uh, and he had been walking through me with me through all my, you know, my overthinking, my insecurities, my anxiety, and, and he watched me really just um, be a shell of myself my whole rookie year. And, and he told me, he said, he said, Jeremy, this might be your last game in the NBA. If it is, you gotta go out playing Jeremy Lin basketball. And that really stuck with me. And I was like, I gotta swing for the fences tonight and just go for it. Jeremy Lin, and you're a pretty big ovation. Growing up, New York basketball was not easy to like. Basketball in New York City is its lifeblood. And the Knicks have been awful. And he brought energy to the Knicks like I've never seen before and haven't seen since. He started, I was just, I was loose. And I just feel like that was really supernatural because I struggled a lot with pregame anxiety, but like for whatever reason, that day when I got subbed in, I was just ready. Jeremy Lin drives and finishes. Nice play from three for 14. Normally, if I had four points in a game, I'd be like, dude, that's a good game. So I was like, dude, that's a great half. Like, I'm really happy with this half. But then in the second half, like, I don't even know what happened. It was just a blur. It just flowed, and I was just got in the zone. The magical night for Jeremy Lin. He's the hero from Harvard on uh, the game of his life. Immediately, I, I went to eat with my parents. My phone was just going insane. Like I had hundreds of messages. And then I got home, you know, and I was with my brother and sister-in-law and I was about to crash on their couch. They were like, dude, what happened? I was like, I don't know. And we were just like, we we're all in shock. And then I pull up ESPN and I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the front page. And so now we're all geeking out and I'm taking photos and screenshots. Coolest thing about it was I got to celebrate it with the people that I was closest to who had been with me, who had told me not to quit when I was ready to quit. Gordon was absolutely electric. Every game felt like game seven. Nick fans are still excited, but not as exciting as it was during, you know, Lynn Saturday. I became a Knicks fan at the time. Um, I think he gave us a lift at a time when we needed it. Lynn Saturday brought a ton of energy and a, and, a, and a little bit of winning, which we didn't have at that time. I hated it for years. Like, I just, I, my whole life, I've always wanted to just be like, like Jeremy, like almost felt like phenomenon, which I was never really down with. But I realized like later, I came to really accept it and embrace it now because to other people, that was that. That was like such a moment of inspiration. You know, he could have been a king of New York. Then he just, you know, it's get this hope, this, this energy, this love that, you know, this one guy just brought to the city. And then just like that, it was gone. I was always the underdog. I was always surprising people. It was always like, oh, he's better than we thought. So I've never been in a position where I was like, I had any expectations. Now it's like, I almost became like public enemy number one um, in, in, to the New York fan base 
And I think what was really disheartening about it was that the, the claims that were and the things that were people were saying about me weren't true. And I think that's what really hurt me. And that's when I kind of realized like perception is reality. And, and and I actually tried to, you know, go back and ask the Rockets. I wanted the Rockets to give me less so that New York could match. I was trying to do everything behind the scenes so I could stay in New York. Um, and, and a lot of what had happened in the, the aftermath and the fallout, I actually still to this day am not aware of why it happened, or how it happened or whatever. But that fallout was one of the tougher things that I've had to experience. And, and it really bothered me deeply. Um, and I felt extremely misunderstood. You know, there was just this energy that's hard to really vocalize, you know, unless you're from a, a city or a town that has a sports team that they just love. To see the garden actually light up changed my perspective on basketball a little bit. It's the Knicks, no matter whether they're good or bad, no matter what. And fans the Knicks fans, they're always going to appreciate that, no matter what. As a New Yorker, I'm glad that we had Jeremy Lin in our city. So, Jeremy, man, we loved you, we still love you, and I still have all the wristbands, the Linsanity wristbands, I have about 30 of them, sitting in a box in my house, and we always are looking uh, right smart. That's cool. Man, I'll always have love for New York. Every time I go back, it's just, it's love. 10 years, even, even nine, 10 years later, doesn't matter. If I'm back there, it's like, dude, let me tell you where I was when this happened. Dude, let me tell you how this impacted me. We were thinking about what's the best way to honor the 10 year anniversary of insanity. Um, and we felt like the best way to honor is to give back because the city and the fans gave us so much. And so um, we're starting a, a fundraising campaign to be able to um, give the, the profits and the proceeds to uh, organizations in New York to be able to try to help. You're looking at setbacks in, in education and in resources, opportunities. You're, you're looking at mental health issues for youth. You're looking at a lot of um, delay, you know, and, and restriction of, of access to sports and extracurriculars. Like we're in this together. We're a community. We're a humanity. And that's what's so special about the story. It could have happened in any city, but the fact that it happened in New York at MSG. There's no better city for it to happen in the world.